All right, Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy 34, we are wrapping this up today. Just over a year ago, we started Deuteronomy. And uh, it has been a trek, a road, a journey. For some of you, it's been light. For some of you, it's been heavy. There's mixed emotions on Deuteronomy. I told you last week I have kids in my house who are singing hallelujah because they're done. I'm, I'm sure there's more of you. I am. I'm really sure there is more of you, but it's been a journey. I've enjoyed it. Deuteronomy 34. Before we jump in there, uh, if you need a Bible, there's some on the chairs there around you. If you're using those, page 137, or if the Bible has a flame in front of it, page 177. 137, or if it has a flame, 177. I want to kind of do a quick recap of this book before we jump into 34 to, to kind of just look back over it and, and, and give you some high points that I hope stick with you as we, as we think back on the book of Deuteronomy. One, I hope your life has changed because of it. I, I hope it has unlocked some keys and some understanding to the rest of scriptures that maybe you didn't have before. Well, what we see in the book of Deuteronomy, it's part of what's called the Torah. It's part of what, what we know as the Torah, right? The Torah could be the first five books, but we've learned that Torah is so much more than that. We typically see a translation of Torah as law, but I've tried to drill home that it is not simply just law. That's one component of what Torah is. The word can mean instruction, and then therefore it encompasses all kinds of things. And so what we have in Deuteronomy, we have narrative, we have history, we have a story of what God is doing. And what he does among his people, how he reveals himself, that's part of Torah. We have instructions on what it looks like to live in a relationship with God, that's part of Torah. We have God revealing himself as the type of God that he is, that's, type, that's part of Torah. We have uh, blessings and curses based on obedience or disobedience to the covenant, that's part of Torah. So it's part of Torah, and, and as we think about this book... Torah is God revealing himself, God instructing his people about who he is and how they are to live in a relationship with him, him who is holy, and his people who he set apart to be holy. So as such, then, this book is really about the gospel. This book is about the gospel because we have the creator God who created all things. His creation has rebelled against him. And even though he is the creator God and would be completely just in bringing his wrath upon those who are at enmity with him, those who have rebelled against him, he has instead revealed himself to his creation so that they might know him, know him as God, and then respond to him in kind as the creator God. He has then gone further than that, and he has instructed his people about who he is and how to live in a relationship with him. In order to be in a relationship with him, he has redeemed his people out of slavery and bondage. After redeeming his people out of slavery and bondage is where then he revealed his instruction about how to live in that relationship. And so what we've learned about the gospel then as we go through the book of Deuteronomy is one, God's Torah, his instruction is always undergirded by grace. Always. There's, there's not such a hard distinction that we tend to make between law and grace, but God's Torah, his law, his instruction is all grace because it's all him revealing himself to us, which is an act of grace that we then might know him. We also find out that the, uh, the, the first covenant that we are reading about here uh, in, in the uh, book of Deuteronomy is not about obeying in order to be redeemed. It's not about obeying in order to be accepted. It's not about obeying in order to become the people of God. It's once God has redeemed you, then your response is faithful obedience because of that redemption. That's the order that, that we see throughout the book of Deuteronomy. You obey not in order to be accepted by God or to be redeemed. You obey because he's done that for you. And then obedience is your response. That's the gospel. And so as I think through the, the overall book, um, you remember in Deuteronomy 5 is where we saw the 10 words, or we most commonly call them the 10 commandments. The 10 words or the 10 commandments are like a skeletal structure for the rest of the covenant. And the rest of the, the book of Deuteronomy unpacks those 10 words, those 10 commandments as to what it looks like to not have any God besides him, to not take his name in vain, to, uh, to honor the Sabbath, to not worship idols, things like that, right? It, it unpacks what that looks like. 
And so the, the ten words of the Ten Commandments are a skeletal structure upon which the rest of the book of Deuteronomy is filling in the flesh, putting in the meat. But in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, is the heart of the covenant. We called it the Shema, right? Because the Hebrew word that starts that verse out is Shema, which means to hear or listen, but not just take in content audibly, but to hear in such a way that you then act on it in obedience. And so Deuteronomy 6, 4, hear, O Israel, Yahweh your God, Yahweh is God alone, or he is God is one. Your God is one, right? And then, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then from there it goes on and it says, teach these things. That's the heart. Because at the heart of the covenant is our response to who God is and how he's revealed himself. Our response to how we live in light of being in a relationship with him is we love him. And out of love for him, we obey him. And that's the bottom line of the book. And so... When we read through that, then what we see is God revealing himself so that people might know him, know how to live in the relationship with him. We find out that Torah, that God's instruction, leads to life because it comes from him. And we find out in Deuteronomy that Yahweh, the God of the creator God, the God of Israel, is life. When we live our lives in faithful obedience to God in accordance with his ways, we experience the fullness of life because he is life. All right, so that's some of the the, the ways I wanted to summarize this for you. As we turn now to chapter 34 and we finish out this book, now this book was written by Moses, but chapter 34 was not. And that's not a problem because Moses cannot write about his own death or what happened after his own death, unless God revealed it to him. But you're going to see as we read through this, this is clearly someone else who came back around and added this part before the, the book was all put together. They added this part to kind of sum it all up. And we, best we can tell, it's probably somewhere within 100 years or so because of the way they, they use certain names. So this is an editor, maybe Joshua, maybe someone else, coming back around and saying, okay, now here's the final things that took place. So let's take a look. Deuteronomy chapter 34, here's where we're going this morning. Our God is faithful in every season to make good on his promise. Our God is faithful in every season to make good on his promise. Let's look at verse 1. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. The Lord showed him all the land, Gilead, as far as Dan. All Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. We've seen For several chapters now, ever since chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, that Moses was not going to go into the land. In fact, we learned about that in Numbers chapter 27, uh, that he was not going to be permitted to go in the land. But we've been anticipating this moment ever since. And now has come this moment. Moses has said all that he needs to say. God has given all Moses needs to to proclaim. And now God says, I want you to go up to this mountain. I'm going to show you all the land that I promised. So he's not going into it. He's not crossing over the Jordan, but God is going to show him all this land, all of the land. And he says to him, at the end of verse uh, 3 here, or actually verse 4, the Lord said, this is the land of which I swore. God is being faithful to the promise he made to Abraham, which was passed on to Isaac, which was passed on to Jacob. He's being faithful to keep his promise. I told them I was going to give them this land The people that that are about to cross over are about to take inheritance of the land that I've promised to your forefathers. I will give it to your offspring. He's making good on his promise. I've let you see it with your eyes. That's the kindness of God there. Moses was disobedient. He hit the rock when he should have spoke to the rock because that was God's instruction. And therefore, he was guilty of not upholding God's holiness. That's why he's not able to go in the land. Numbers 20 And Numbers chapter 27 tell us those stories. 
And so God says, you're not going to the land, but I'm going to show it to you. Your eyes at least get to see it. That's the kindness of God. Sometimes God is kind even when we don't deserve it. He doesn't have to be, but he extends his kindness to us. And that's what he's doing for Moses. I've let you see with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. Okay, that's where we are. Let's keep going. Verse 5. Verse 5, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day, to the day of this writing. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor was unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. Verse 5, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land, according to the word of the Lord. The person who came back around and wrote this made sure to tell us he was 120 years old. His eyes were not fading, and he had lost none of his vigor for life. He, he He had not tired of going in and out to battle, to leading the people. He had not started to wane in his energy or his vitality of life. He didn't die because he became weakened. He didn't die because of sickness. He didn't die because of disease. He wasn't killed in war. He died because this was the appointed time by God, which tells us something. Death is in the sovereignty of God. Death is under the sovereignty of God. Now, how does that flesh out? There are things in this life, choices that we might make, that could lead us to death. Absolutely. 1 John chapter 5 talks about a sin that leads to death. All sin, he says, is lawlessness, but there is a type of sin that leads to death. It's possible we could live our lives choosing to sin, and the choices we're making and the sin that we're committing will lead us to death. And it's not a surprise to God. But it impacts our death but it doesn't fall outside of the sovereignty of God because death is always under the sovereign hand of God. With Moses, what we see is he could have kept going. He was a picture of health as far as we know. There was no reason for him to die, and yet it was God's appointed time. There is, there is no way that we are going to live and outlive God's appointed time for us. So whether or not that is, um, the the timing seems off to us, we can rest in, in, in assurance. If I have been living my life in obedience to God, and yet I'm facing death, then, then I, can, I can rest in assurance that this is under the sovereign hand of God. If I am choosing to live my life, and I'm participating in a type of sin that leads to death, I need to know that this type of sin could lead to death. But even that falls under the sovereignty of God. He's not surprised by it. It's not throwing his plan and his purpose off. I could do everything I could possibly want to do to to be a picture of health. And yet, if it's God's appointed time, it's God's appointed time. Okay? What that does for us is this. And particularly, if I am in Christ, as we talked about with the baptism, and I have the hope of life that overcomes death, I don't need to fear death. I don't need to fear it. I can, I, we've, heard, we've heard updates from, from Haiti. We heard updates from the rainbows uh, last week. And one of the things we hear from people who are living in countries like that where, where they say every day could be your last day. You don't know when you leave the house if you're making it back. One of the things the rainbows shared with us is they pray about which route to take when they go to the airport. And the Lord guides and directs them. When we hear from Wawa in Haiti, we know that when he leaves his house, he doesn't know if he's going to get to see his family again or if his family's going to make it back. They live every day like that. There's people all around the world who live every day like that. And for us, living in our comfort and our security, we can't fathom that. And yet there is an assurance and a comfort and a peace that if it's the Lord's appointed time, it's the Lord's appointed time. We're not going to outrun that or outlive that. And I can be, I can be encouraged by that. I heard somebody else say, and this needs to be probably nuanced and, 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 and unpacked a little bit, but I've heard someone say, we are basically immortal until it's God's time. Think about it. We are basically immortal until it's God's time. Now, the reason I say that has to be unpacked and and, and can't be just taken at face value is because someone could take a statement like that and go, therefore, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. That's not the point, because there's a sin that leads to death, right? And you do what you want to do, and that sin might be the one that leads you to death. 
But all of death is under the sovereign hand of God. Also, that while I'm talking about death, I want to make this statement. I try to make it at funerals. Death is not normal. It's common to our experience, but it's not normal. It's not how it should be. It's not what God intended when he created. It is a result of sin. Therefore, it's not normal, but it's common to our experience. That's an important distinction to make. Because we're all going to face death, but we need to know death is the enemy. Death is the enemy that has been overcome by Jesus in his, in his resurrection, and it will finally be overcome in the day that he returns and our bodies are redeemed. Death is the enemy. We don't make friends with death. We, we don't welcome death as a welcome visitor to our home. It is the enemy, but it is common to our experience because of sin. Romans 5, because um, sin entered the world, death spread to all people because all sinned. Moses dies at the appointed time of the Lord, not before, not after. And so, um, before I move on past that, if there's a fear of death in the room, if there is a fear of death in the room, an untimely death, and I, I'm, I'm aware of one person who said this, I'm not singling that person out, nor am I saying it because of that person. If there is a fear of death in the room because of untimely death or the fear of an untimely death, that is not of God. Okay? Take that thought captive into obedience to Christ. Take that fear, confess that fear to the Lord, and take that thought captive. Do not let it pay rent there. Death, fear of death, if you are a believer in Christ, that is not from God. The other thing you need to consider is if you live with a sense of a fear of death, take, take examination of your life. Is there unconfessed sin, unrepentant sin? Because if you are living in unconfessed or unrepentant sin, it could be that the reason you're experiencing fear of death is you're actually experiencing this sense of impending judgment of God, and it's manifesting itself as a fear of death, in which case you need to deal with that sin. Bring it out into the light. Confess it. Repent of it. Walk in the forgiveness that is purchased for us in Christ at the cross. Be cleansed from all unrighteousness and live with a hope. Live with a hope that transcends death. Okay? All right. Let's keep going. Verse 9. Verse 9. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, so the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel." So you see now why Moses didn't write this. That'd be an odd thing for Moses to write about himself. So we see this transfer of, of, of authority. Now what we read in verse 9 is that uh, Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom because or for Moses had laid his hands on him. Now you go back to Numbers. Uh, I can't remember the chapter off the top of my head. Maybe it's 15, but don't quote me. It's in, in Numbers where Mo, uh, Moses commissions Joshua. And we see there that... It, in Numbers, we're, we see Joshua already described as being full of the Spirit. So this is not to be taken as, until this moment, Joshua lacked the Spirit. He was already full of the Spirit. But what we see taking place here was there was a commissioning that took place where Moses put his hands on Joshua in front of the people, and he transferred his authority. He commissioned Joshua in front of all the people. Because of that transfer of, of authority, which was given by God from Moses to Joshua, the people are going to follow Joshua and be obedient to the Lord just as Moses commanded. It. But we see that that took place. The laying on of hands here, um, just a note about that, we see that throughout scriptures when people pray for people. You put hands on. It's a good and right thing, and we see that in both Old and New Testament. Can you pray for people without putting hands? Absolutely. But there's something about when you have the opportunity to put a hand on someone, whether it's a shoulder or if you're praying for a specific body part, if it's appropriate, you put it there. Right? There's something about the hand being on another person. There's a connection. The Spirit of God within you connects with the Spirit of God within them. There's, there's a sense of nearness. There's a sense of comfort that can come from that, a sense of encouragement that can come from that. It may be awkward. It may be uncomfortable. But don't discount it. 
Don't discount it. There's, if there's an opportunity, put a hand. Can I put a hand on your shoulder? Can I put a hand on your back? And let's pray. You could pray for them right there and stand like this. But I'm going to encourage you. Take that moment. Say, would you mind if I put a hand on your shoulder while we pray? Or, you know, if it's appropriate, depending on who you're praying with. Can we hold hands? There's power in that. There's power in that because of the Spirit of God. All right, and then he says this in verse 10, and this is where we're going to camp out the rest of this, this sermon here. There has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. So that word since, what he, whoever wrote this, they're saying up to that point. So maybe somewhere within 100 years, because of the way some of the things are phrased, we, we know, like, for instance, um, just so you know what I'm talking about, uh, when, when he shows Moses the land, the way he describes the, na- the land, the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead, as far as Dan, all that fly, Ephraim, Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the Western Sea. Just the way he phrases that tells us it's before a certain point. Because at a certain point, the way that it oftentimes got summed up was from Dan all the way down to Beersheba. Or, or, or something, there's a phrase like that that started to take, take um, a root and was used. And so that's how we know about the timeline that this last part was written in. All right. So there has not arisen a prophet in Israel since this point of writing, like Moses. We've talked about this before. There were other prophets during the time of Moses. He was not the only prophet. He was the only one like him. There were other prophets in the time of Moses. God was speaking to other people, revealing things to other people. There was the ministry of prophets through other people besides Moses. Uh, Moses' sister Miriam is called a prophetess, right? But what we're told is there was no one like Moses. Because what we're told is that while those other prophets were receiving revelation from God, he would give it to them in dreams or in visions. But Moses, Moses got it face to face. There's a greater level of intimacy that Moses experienced, which makes him unique among all the prophets of his day. And there had not been one that rose up like him since. Because of the signs and the wonders and the mighty deeds that God did through Moses in Egypt, when he brought them out through the wilderness, there's not been another prophet since this time that rose up that was like Moses in the mighty deeds, in the wonders and the signs that have taken place. Sure, there have been other prophets, Elijah, Elisha, who have done some pretty pretty miraculous things, but nothing compared to what Moses did. So he stands in a category on his own. But Moses himself said there would be another prophet like him that God would raise up. Back in Deuteronomy 18, we looked at this before, but I'm reminding you here, back in Deuteronomy 18, here's what Moses said in verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So Moses himself said there's going to be another prophet. At the end of Deuteronomy, we find out that there had not been another prophet in Israel that had risen like Moses since. So the question becomes, has there been now? Has there now been another prophet like Moses that has arisen in Israel from among the people of Israel whom God has put his words in that prophet's mouth so that the people of God should listen to him and those who do not listen to the things that he speaks, God would require it of him. Has there been a prophet? And if there has, who is it? And what do we do with that? One of the things we saw about Moses was he was a deliverer. Through Moses, God took a people that was, that was under the covenant of God that he had made, and he brought those people out from enslavement, out of darkness, a dark kingdom, and brought them to his promised land. But he brought them through a deliverer, Moses. He raised up a man, Moses, a prophet, Moses. And through Moses, he spoke his words through Moses. And then he delivered the people out of enslavement that they had lived in for so many centuries. Has there been another deliverer? And Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21, Jesus, 
goes to a synagogue. We start the book of Matthew in two weeks, by the way. And so this is going to be a primer for some of the things we're going to see in the gospel. He gets up in the synagogue, and he starts to read from the scroll. And he gets the scroll of Isaiah. He finds what we would call chapter 61. There would have been no chapters on it, but he finds the spot he's looking for, and he reads from it. He came from Nazareth. He's reading from Isaiah, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. This is from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture, what he just read, has been fulfilled in your hearing. Has there been another who has been raised up to set people free? Yeah. Yeah. Moses, we talked about the intimacy that Moses had with Jehovah, with, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, how he spoke face to face. Now, that's an expression. He never actually saw God's face because you remember he said, show me your glory. And God said, I can't let you look upon my glory because you can't bear that. You die. I'll hide you in the rock and I'll pass by you. And he gets to look at the backside. Right? So the face-to-face -face expression is about intimacy because when you have a conversation with someone and they're side to side, you're, you're kind of like this and you're like talking like this and that's not very intimate. Right? But you're having a casual conversation. But when you're with someone here and you're face to face, it's hard to look at someone in the eyes. It's hard. It's hard to sustain that. But when you're turned shoulder to shoulder, knee to knee, that's a different level of intimacy than side by side. That's the picture of intimacy. So Moses, we know, had this intimacy with Yahweh that no one else had. He was able to go up upon a mountain where he met with God for 40 days and 40 nights, and he received the Torah, the instruction of God. Has there been another prophet who has had that level of intimacy or something even comparable or maybe even greater? Yeah, there has been. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Just an example. There's lots of other scriptures we can go to, but... Just giving you one for each. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Moses was a prophet. Moses is described as a servant, but Jesus is the Son. There's a greater level of intimacy. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3, it says Moses was a servant in the house of God, but Jesus is a son over the house of God. The level of intimacy is greater. Why? Because Jesus is God. Jesus is the invisible God made visible. Uh, Colossians 2, chapter 2, verse 9 says, In him all the fullness of deity dwelled in bodily form. He is the Son of God. John chapter 1 tells us he was with God in the beginning. He was God and he was with God. And that everything that was made was made through him, through the Son. That's a different level of intimacy. It's a greater level of intimacy when you are the son of God versus the servant of God, right? And so here we see, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. There's a prophet that has been raised up who, who has a greater level of intimacy with the father than even what Moses experienced. What about these signs and wonders? The things that Moses did. Has there been a prophet that has been raised up who has done anything like that or even greater? And of course, you, you know where the answer is now. John chapter 20, just the end of the gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs. See, John captures seven of the major ones. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, which tells us there were things that Jesus did that we don't have written down. And that's okay, too, because each of the writers wrote for a very specific purpose. And when you write for a specific purpose, you don't include everything. You include what's necessary for your purpose. They're not written in this book, but these are written so that, here's the purpose of those signs and wonders, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Signs and wonders from God serve a purpose. They serve a purpose. Jesus did signs and wonders even greater. The greatest one, by the way, 
the resurrection. The greatest one, the one that John ends with, the resurrection. We go on. One of the things we learned about Moses was he was a mediator of a covenant. He stood between God and people, and he delivered the the terms of the covenant, and he was the one that was, was the mediator. He delivered it. He stood in between them so that this covenant could be enacted with the people from God. Has there been another prophet who's been raised up who has mediated a covenant like Moses? In fact, yes, there is. And we're told that he actually mediated a better covenant, not because the old one or the, the first one was, was uh, in, inferior in the sense that it lacked something, but that because with the, the greater covenant comes greater things because the first covenant is a shadow. and a shadow of things yet to come. Look at this. This is from Hebrews chapter 8. This is guy's writing to Hebrew believers. He's writing about the Messiah, Jesus. He says, talking about the things in the first covenant, the tabernacle, the temple, that were all to be built uh, according to the exact instruction of God. He says, they serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. So we have a prophet who's been raised up who is a mediator of what Hebrews tells us is a better covenant, a better covenant. This is the last one I have for you. Moses, where did he go to get his, the instructions, the Torah? Top of the mountain, Right? There on the top of the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, God revealed his instructions, his Torah, to Moses. And then Moses came and then he instructed the people. Watch this. And we're going to see this in Matthew 2. But just a teaser, just a teaser. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, So Moses receives the Torah, the instruction of God, but Jesus is the very embodiment and fulfillment of it. And from a mountain, though uh, Moses received the instructions on a mountain, then he came to teach the people. But Jesus, the very embodiment and the very fulfillment of the Torah, now sits on this mountain and he instructs people himself on how to live in light of the relationship of God. So we have this prophet who's been raised up. We have God showing himself faithful in every season because Moses passed away, but but the people were still going to inherit the promises as Joshua stepped in. And yet Moses said, there's going to be a prophet who's going to be raised up and you should listen to him. And there has been a prophet that has been raised up just as God said he would do. And we are told we must listen to him. We are told that if we do not listen to the things that this prophet, that God would raise up, because God would put his words in the mouth of this prophet and he would instruct us. Jesus, when he came, he says, I only say what I hear the Father saying. I only do what I see the Father doing. Fully God. And yet he willingly submitted himself to the Father. And so all that Jesus said and did was what he heard and saw the Father doing. The very words that came out of his mouth were the very words that the Father was speaking. And if we don't listen to him, God says, I will require it of him, the person who does not listen to him. One of the first things that Jesus is going to proclaim is repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn back. If you've turned away from God, turn back. If you stopped living in accordance with his ways, turn back. Prepare yourself because the kingdom of God is at hand. One of the other things we read about in the the book of Acts is that there is salvation is found in no other name but Jesus. So then in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer, he says, what must I do to be saved? And and Paul and, and his friends said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God has raised up a prophet, a deliverer, a mediator of a covenant, the very word of God embodied. The invisible God made visible, and he instructs us, repent, turn back, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's our first, first response to what God has done. And then after that, we then continue to live our life in faithful obedience to him. As the Spirit of God chips away at things, I had someone asking me this week about living in certain ways, and, and I said, you know, 
when someone comes to Christ, there's a whole lot of stuff that's still there. It's not our job to, to scrub them clean and get them polished so they can show up to church. I didn't say it like that to the person. It's not our job, but we like to make it our job. We need to let the Spirit of God work in each person and trust Him. And let those things that are, that are, that are from the darkness They'll get dealt with in the Spirit's time. And now, you may be able to speak into those things. I'm not saying be silent and, and overlook them or condone them. You may be able to speak into them. But man, we are real guilty at shooting our own people. We're real guilty about shooting our own people because you don't measure up. You haven't cleaned up yet. Man, look at your life. When you became a believer, you weren't that pretty either. And where you are now was not where you were then. And thank God for His grace. Thank God for his mercy and that people hopefully let you in the timing of God grow and be sanctified and let the spirit of God reveal things to you, sometimes through others, sometimes through his word, sometimes maybe through other ways, and then you respond in obedience. But man, you want to stop someone's growth? Start pointing out to them all the things that you think they need to deal with. Listen, what you see may not be what the spirit's working on at that moment. And the things that you see those may be down the list for the Spirit, even though on your list they're at the top. There may be other things going on that's being cut away here that once those things are dealt with, all those other things will just fall. But if you force someone, if I force someone to comply into a mold, that's not a person who's going to be sanctified by the Spirit. That's a person who's going to be sanctified by a religious spirit. They're going to learn how to be compliant. They're going to learn how to look like a churched person. They will be like a whitewashed tomb. Pretty on the outside, rotten on the inside. The Spirit of God has always been more concerned with the inside before the outside. Okay? Our God is faithful in every season to make good on his promises. He said in Philippians 1, Paul said, I am confident that he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. God is not done with you. He has not abandoned you nor forsaken you. He will work his purpose and his plan to conform you to the image of his son. He will bring it about. Father, would you let your spirit now come and help us to understand the things you want us to get from the things in your word this morning. If I've taught anything this morning or at any point throughout this series that is not accurate to you and your word, then correct it, reveal it so we might uh, correct that, block our ears from it. But where there are things that are true and right and good and lovely and pure and holy, let us think upon these things. Let them be like seeds that are planted in fertile soil of our hearts. And so, God, till the ground of our hearts, the soil of our hearts, if it needs to, if it's hard and it needs rain, let your spirit bring rain upon our hearts so that it might be softened. Break up the ground that it might be able to receive the seeds of your word. That they might then bear roots that go deep that then bear a tree, a crop that bears much fruit. Cut away the things that are dead within us and about us and around us. Prune the things that need to be lifted that we might bear more fruit. Draw those in this room to you who need to, to go from enslavement to sin and be redeemed, purchased and brought out of that enslavement and brought into the kingdom of your beloved son, the kingdom where you rule and reign and where there is life. Teach us to live in accordance with your ways that we might know life, that we might know you, because you are life. Here before we dismiss, um, I'm going to invite our prayer team forward. If you're available to pray with folks after the service, go ahead and grab one of those lanyards and you can go ahead and come forward at this point. Um, they'll be up here for any of you who want to pray about anything. That could be something stirred up in the sermon. That could be something going on in your life. That could be sickness, disease. That could be whatever. That could be I have questions about the gospel, trusting in Jesus, beginning a relationship with them. They, they'll be prepared to visit with you about all those things. And they'll be looking for you. So, so they're there for you. You guys can make your way up now. So now as we depart from here, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face upon you 
and give you peace. Amen. See you next week.